involving users in the design process is hopefully already a key practice in your day-to-day -day work. This practice often goes by the name of co-design. But do you know the difference between co-design and good co-design? Well, the differences are significant and we're going to explore them in this episode. As you'll learn, not all co-design is created equal. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Emma Blomkamp. This is The Service Design Show, episode 183. Hi, my name is Mark Fontaine, and welcome back to a brand new episode of The Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are those hidden and invisible things that make the difference between success and failure all to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people, business, and our planet. Our guest in this episode is Emma Ballonkamp. Emma is a respected coach and mentor on the topic of co-design, and she's also the founder of Co-Design Co, which is a network of people learning and sharing about co-design and related practices in order to achieve equity, regeneration, and well-being. We've all seen dozens of examples of products and services where the user wasn't involved in the design process, where the solution seemed like a great idea on paper or was driven by an interesting technology AI. <laughs> Once released upon the market, this solution completely flopped and got no adoption by the users. So I probably don't have to convince you of the value of involving users in the design process. Solutions where users haven't been involved are just much more likely to fail. Very likely. Or when you take a more positive standpoint, involving the users just increases the likelihood that your solutions will be adopted and actually used by your end customers. So we should all try to involve the user in our design process, right? Well, not so fast. Because when done in a careless way, it can actually backfire and cause a lot of unnecessary harm. So there is a significant difference between co-design and good co-design. And in this conversation with Emma, we're going to explore what good actually looks like. If you stick around till the end, you'll have learned in which situations you shouldn't strive to do co-design at all. You'll also learn how you can make a strong case for building deeper relationships with users, even though it seems more expensive in the short run. We also talk about the major pitfalls that can derail even the best co-design intentions and how you can handle the heavy responsibility that comes with involving users in the design process. I hope this got you excited to learn all the things there are about co-design. So it's time to jump into the great conversation with Emma Blomkamp. Welcome to the show, Emma. Hi, Mark. Good to have you on. Uh, going to talk about a topic that's very dear to your heart. And I think that's an understatement. Uh, we're going to talk about co-design and everything related to it. Before we dive into that, Emma, uh, as always, uh, it's really nice to hear a little bit about your background and what you do currently. I know you do a lot. So uh, could you uh, yeah, give us a brief introduction? Of course. Thanks so much for having me. I usually start my co-design story in Auckland, New Zealand in 2013. I'd already done a few different things for work and studies. I kept returning to university. I just completed a PhD and I had to get a job. Um, so I found myself working at a little social innovation agency in Auckland where I learned on the job all about co-design and social innovation and community-based behavior change campaigns and got really excited about all those things uh, and met a lot of great people, learned a lot and have been obsessed with co-design ever since. So mm. from there, I um, a few years later moved to Melbourne, Australia, where I am based now and 
had a brief return to academia where I was at the policy lab at the University of Melbourne, um, but very much focusing on design capability in the public sector and co-design for policy. Worked then as a um, strategic design consultant for a little bit before in January 2020 launching my own business, not knowing at all what the world had in ho- had in store for us, um, but have been really fortunate to have uh, had lots of great clients and opportunities, and I'm sure we'll get the chance to talk about some of them. You also run a community. I'm all into communities these days. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So one of the favorite uh, things that I do is run a training program called Co-Design Practitioners. It used to be called Co-Design Bootcamp. And one of the things that I noticed uh, when participants finished their seven or eight months that they'd spent with this wonderful group of 15 people sharing and learning together, that they wanted to stay connected with each other, with me, with the resources I provided. And so about two years ago, I started developing um, a, a community membership model based based on that and working with an associate at the time. We then launched 18 months ago as Co-Design Co, which is a community of practice for people who are committed to co-creating compassionate systems. So it is about co-design, but it's also about more than co-design, really any kinds of creative and participatory methods we can use to create positive change in the world. And uh this is a community where every well it's open to everybody from around the world it's not just limited to australia right yeah that's right we were initially entirely online when we started we'd just come out of the really hard lockdowns that melbourne had experienced and it didn't even occur to me to think about in person at that point so naturally we were online and being online although the time zone can be a challenge we are we're and are open to people from all around the world. Our strongest kind of cohort of members is based in Australia, um, and with my connections with Aotearoa New Zealand, we've got a few members in New Zealand, and then kind of a sprinkling of people in mm. all over the world: Indonesia, Qatar, mm. the States, Canada, uh, and, and and some in Europe too. <laughs> it's interesting. We need to see how we can mix up our communities because the Circle community, uh, which I host has a strong representation in Europe and North and South America with a little bit of sprinkling from Australia. But I think there is a lot of overlap in uh, in the interest uh, of our our members. So that's maybe something we need to continue uh, outside of this uh, conversation. Yep, I'm all for collaboration and exchange. So there's a lot to do uh, and a lot of value to create in this community. Uh, thanks for this introduction, Emma. But um, as you might know, we always have a lightning round with five questions to get to know you as a person next to the professional a little bit better. So five questions you haven't prepared for. Just the first thing that comes to your mind. Are you ready? Sure. Sure. <laughs> Alrighty. What's always in your fridge? Nuts. Smoked almonds, preferably. In your fridge? <laughs> yes, that's an Australian thing. I'd never done, I'd never put nuts in the fridge until moving here. Apparently they stay fresher for longer. That's interesting. All righty, noted that one. Um, if you could recommend uh, just one book for us to read, which book would you recommend? The first one that came to mind is Cloud Atlas. Don't judge it by the film. Um, the book is quite wonderful by David Mitchell. Got it, noted. What did you want to become when you were a kid? As a typical girl in the 1990s who was obsessed with dolphins, I wanted to become a marine biologist. Hmm. I wasn't very good at science, though. So then I wanted to become the first woman prime minister of New Zealand. But then somebody else beat me to it. (laughs) You can can try to become second. Um, All righty. Next question is, uh, if you could watch a single movie for the rest of your life, which movie would you pick? Amelie, I think. The French film. Oh, got it. And the fifth and final question, which I'm really curious about to learn more uh, from you, is do you recall the first moment you sort of got in touch or heard about service design? It would have definitely been in in my first job in Auckland when I had to Google co-design and social innovation to get the job. I didn't know about this field at all. I think my strongest first memory is doing the service design jam 
And so I took part in a weekend of service design activities when I was really new um, in that job and had a wonderful time. Yeah. Uh, shout out to Adam, Marcus, and everybody else who uh, still is sort of uh, pulling the jams forward. Uh, cool. Thanks, Emma. Thanks for sharing that. Um, this was a nice introduction. And now let's go uh, deeper into the co-design stuff that you're so passionate about. And I think even though it might sound a bit obvious, but I'm really curious to um, hear a bit more about your definition of co-design because everybody is using it quite loosely. What is your perspective on that? What is, what is co-design? In the most simple terms, the most plain language, I'd say co-design is making stuff together. If we want to get a little bit more nuanced about it, then I would say it is using creative and participatory methods to create something new or to change something. Um, and then I've got academic definitions that I, I can pull out as well, but that's maybe enough of a starting point. Well, we'll add uh, academic definitions to the uh, show notes <laughs> for anyone who wants to dive deeper into this. So creating stuff together and you uh, in our uh, pre-interview, pre-conversation uh, chat, you mentioned creating better outcomes. Um, this is maybe the follow-up question. And again, I'm going to try to ask the st silly and stupid questions, but why do you feel co-design is important? Well, we only need to look around and see all of the dysfunctional systems that we're part of, the, the health systems, the justice systems, the education systems, all of these systems that aren't getting good results and wonder how things could be different. I think one of the reasons we don't get good results is that decisions get made on behalf of people, that the people who are most affected by uh, an issue aren't usually involved in designing the response to it. And when I've been involved in co-design programs that have really meaningfully involved people to develop mutual understanding of issues. So often it's not just asking what people already know, but actually creating new understanding by exchanging perspectives by lots of different people who have different experiences on a system, including, you know, if we're talking health, for instance, it's, you know, the people who work in it, as well as people who are patients or consumers and their family members. So building understanding and then coming up with better ideas about what we can do and ideally also being involved in iterating and implementing those ideas in iterative ways. Mm -hmm. How does this align with you? One of the things I wonder about is whether here in Australia and New Zealand we have a particular understanding of co-design and it might be different in different parts of the world. Mm. That's a good question. Usually I'm not uh, on the receiving end of the questions. Um, but I, I can tap into some of my experience uh, when still doing uh, the studio work. And I think co-design has, has, has been a, a fundamental part of our work back then. I think um, I, don't, I don't see a lot of difference between what you're describing um, here, especially I'm based in the Netherlands. Um, the university in Delft has a strong uh, co-design representation, co-design uh, agenda. So I think the term um, landed quite early, I think, in uh, in the design space. So yeah, um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I see a lot of similarities. I don't see any meaningful differences there. And I think I, we draw a lot on the Scandinavian traditions of cooperative design and participatory design, as well as local indigenous ways of knowing and being. Here in Australia, we've got the, the longest kind of continued civilization. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have been here for tens of thousands of years. And, you know, there are, there are really ancient practices of just coming together, exchanging ideas, building understanding, solving problems together that I think we draw on, as well as the European traditions um, to, to have a really nice mix of practices here. So, um, Emma, one of the questions that I had here in my notes preparing this conversation is something that I think we really need to dive into a deeper. There is a difference between doing co-design and doing good co-design. 
are doing it well. What's your take on this? Yeah, I'd also add there's a difference between saying you are doing co-design <laughs> and doing co-design and and doing it well. I think it's it can be a bit of a buzzword and you know, some people maybe maybe they truly believe that going into a meeting room with one other person and writing a couple of ideas on a whiteboard is co-design. Um, there are some people who would say, we co yeah, we co-designed it based on that. I wouldn't call that co-design. I'd say you'd need a few more people involved and especially the people who are, you know, really affected by an issue. I think there's a few different ways to think about what good co-design is. If we're talking about especially engaging marginalized people, we need to be really sensitive to some of the challenges and the reasons people have been excluded from design and decision making and need to think really carefully about inclusive facilitation, you know, creating culturally safe spaces, having trauma-informed practice. So there's quite a few considerations there to think about how do we work really ethically and inclusively with people. So I think bad co-design, you know, would, would look like um, we're just a bunch of, you know, white people in a room making decisions on behalf of other cultures. Good co-design would be being sensitive to that and making sure that, you know, not only are you including a wide range of people in your design process, but you're doing it in ways that make them feel safe and, and welcome and able to be creative and contribute meaningfully. Is there, um, I'm going to sort of uh, transition quite quickly into, into different areas that I ha I'm curious about. So... Um, I, I'm assuming that it's not a black or white matter. Like it, you're you're doing bad co-design or you're doing good co-design. What what growth or maturity or progression do you see that people or practitioners can go through? Like where can you start without uh, compromising the the fundamental values of good co-design? Yeah, I think. You make a really good point that it's not just black and white, there's good or bad. One of the things that uh, in my community and with participants in my training, we talk about sometimes is doing things in a co-designer-ly or co-design-ish way, um, because they're quite, there are some quite lofty goals of, you know, fully sharing power that are quite hard to achieve in practice. And I think it's, it's good to follow the ideals and principles of co-design, recognizing that you might not always fully achieve them, but in working towards them, um, you can do well. So in that sense, I think a good place to start is with the principles or the mindsets of co-design. Um, and that might just be something like, how can I be a little bit more inclusive or participatory? So it might be that you are doing a design project that isn't going to be full co-design, but perhaps in the research design, you could let people have a more of a say in which activities they take part in. You could give people a little bit more choice or uh, you could do some testing of your research materials with participants to refine them um, so that they're actually getting to shape them. So there might be some small things you could do to let people have more influence over what you're doing. And I think that could be a place to start. But one of the really important things is that it's actually a meaningful opportunity for people to contribute, that you choose something that can be influenced, that you're not just trying to practice co-design where a decision's already been made, for instance, and the people you're inviting to have some influence have no chance of making any um, actual contribution or changes. So having sort of a, a charter or a manifesto or some principles and values that you state up front uh, things that you try to adhere to to your best ability is or is a good start like knowing what these values are and then trying to to implement them wherever you can and the other thing you mentioned is um that sounds obvious but not using it as lip service or actually like it's it's not co-design if people just have to agree to something <laughs> right if they're it, that's, yeah, that's, totally. To to borrow yeah. to borrow a phrase um, from from my my friend and peer Josh Stepinska, that's faux design, not co-design. Hmm. 
yeah, there is no design part to just giving your opinion, I guess. Mm. Yeah, right? yeah. Just answering a survey is not That's co-design. Not, well, yeah. And I think if we stay true to the design uh, element or the design aspect of co-design, then we all know what good design, well, I hope we have an idea of good, what good design should look like. And that's that's more than just uh, giving a yes or no answer. Cool. So yeah, you want to add to that? No, totally. I think, and I think that's where people can go wrong. Sometimes there's not enough co and sometimes there's not enough design. Mm. Um, but I, I'm imagining in, the, in this podcast, we are talking to more of a design audience. So hopefully they know that if we're talking co-design, there's a design process involved um, and perhaps what they could do is lean a bit more towards the co where there are relevant opportunities to do so. I haven't digged into all of the resources that you have available, but is there like a, a manifesto or a document or something that people can hang on the wall as a as a guide to good co-design? Sort of. I do have a we do have a manifesto for co-design co. Um, but that's that manifesto is more about how we want to show up as a community with each other to practice what we preach and to push our practice. I have a couple of other resources that are freely available on my website. Um, And one of them that I think is quite useful is about uh, co-design maturity. And that's more about people understanding the kind of different levels or stages you might go through on a learning journey that, you know, you don't just go to a half hour webinar and learn everything you need to know about co-design, but there are kind of ways to get to mastery um, and to help recognize what that looks like along the way. I think if you're looking for a good definition of co-design, I would direct you to beyondstickynotes.com, K.A. McKircher's website. They've got a really great definition of co-design and and the principles and the mindsets. Hmm. Cool. Adding that one to our resources in the show notes as well. Staying on this topic, um, if we discuss for a second the things you teach and uh, have thought uh, through your coaching practice, if you look back on it, what do you feel is the most important thing that you teach people? And I can imagine that there's that there's your perspective on what you feel is important, and then there's the feedback from your students or participants, what they feel was the most valuable part. Yeah, and I think it depends which level they're at. So if I think about participants in my co-design practitioners program who are already people who have some experience with co-design, who are already facilitating co-design, but are wanting to really strengthen their participatory practice, the thing I hear from them is that they realize through our program the importance of relationships. So it's not just about getting kind of extracting things from people but the real uh beauty of co-design happens when you build reciprocal relationships and you're actually you know genuinely engaging with people and forming res- you know respect um and care and you're both getting something out of the the exchange is, do you have an example to make this a bit more tangible? Like, what does this look like, or what's what's the before and after? Yeah, I think if I think of an example from some of my earlier work, actually, when I worked in um, a yeah social innovation agency in Auckland, we did a lot of community based co design, and one of our projects was about trying to um, change the behavior of young drivers. So there were a lot of young people who were driving without a license or without the right license. And we were interested in kind of making sure that they were getting through the driver licensing system and then driving with the right license. That was uh, a project that focused on a particular geographic location, a place-based community. And one of the things um, that I think was key to the success of that project was that we... um, me and my colleagues at this agency formed a really great relationship with a community leader who ran a marae, so like a meeting place. And they were um, already doing lots of great things in their community. But, and initially we just approached them because we wanted a venue. We just, we needed somewhere, you know, good local place to hold some workshops. But through getting to know them, we realized that they, you know, they offered a lot more than that. They were also had a family with young people in it who are affected by this issue. And 
started to participate in the project. And one of the things we found was that like we could partner with them on an organizational level as well. So it's like we could look at what their organization needed and how we could support them so that it wasn't just coming along and taking from their community. Uh, And, you know, some of this is just getting to know people and having cups of tea and laughing and finding opportunities where you might be able to easily offer some kind of support or advice or a connection that's beyond the immediate scope of the project, but actually is great for both of you. Thank you for sharing that example. Why do you feel that this is sort of the biggest insight that people get Like, it seems very natural to build relationships as a design practitioner. Yes, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a surprise, should it? I think a lot of the times, I I wonder how, I have, it's a good question. I I don't have a ready answer on it, but I wonder if, you know, so much is to do with the pace and scale at which people are working, especially in design consulting. Um, And in, you know, public sector projects with limited budgets and often financial year deadlines to achieve things, I think a lot of people doing this work are under a lot of pressure to achieve things quickly, to do a lot in a short amount of time. And sometimes the design process can be transactional. It can be about getting people along to get this stuff from them. Um, And I think Sometimes, unfortunately, when people start out in co-design, that's maybe how they see it. Like, this is a good way to get stuff out of people. Um, And it can become quite transactional, especially if you start having to do lots of workshops and lots of engagements with different people. And people also make the mistake around quantity over quality. So people think, oh, we've got to get as many people as possible involved. And there's pressure that definitely comes from outside design, uh, like in a world where numbers have a huge weight to say, oh, we, yeah, we engaged a lot of people rather than we actually worked really closely and built amazing relationships with a few people who were most affected by this, who are now champions of this issue, Mm. say. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's uh, the depth of a relationship versus the the quantity the number of relationships you have and mm. yeah like you said there is a lot of pressure to 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 do busy work and sort of investing the time in in nurturing fostering growing these relationships seems uh quote unquote expensive or <laughs> it's it seems like a big investment and um the thing is that it pays off in the long run and uh you mentioned the the pace and the scale at which people need to operate, usually it's really hard to have a focus on the long run. That's mm. that's maybe one of the big challenges here. Totally. I think it's also challenging. And if I reflect when I was doing this kind of work as a consultant, we were taking, I was working across lots of different sectors. So it was also hard to build up meaningful relationships in that way because I was working with different kinds of people a lot of the time. I think working in a place-based way is useful because you can cut across those sectors and, you know, see in one community how it's affected by lots of different issues. And I think that was maybe one of the big advantages we had um, working in New Zealand and especially working in one particular part of the city a lot, whereas in a larger city, in a larger state, in a larger country, uh, and when I was new to this country, I think I really struggled to have those relationships too. It's not Mm. It's not kind of, yeah, how people are working. But when I look at people who are really successful in this space, they've often been a little more focused on a particular area or a particular issue or a particular sector. And as a result, have been able to build strong relationships in that space. Yeah, and I can second that because uh, regular listeners or viewers of the show know that I have a weak heart for people who work on the inside in-house service design professionals. And that's that's very place based. You can you sort of, if anywhere, you have the opportunity there to build those relationships and to invest in them. And I'm seeing the same pattern. The people who are successful aren't the best quote unquote service design professionals. They are the ones who sort of are able to foster and build these and nurture these relationships. Yeah. So um, Emma, you mentioned this is something uh, that. 
people who are already on the code design journey um, learn or take away and then maybe take it to the next level. I'm assuming that there there is also an implied uh, answer there to the people who aren't yet on that journey. What do they take away? Oh, you have a good memory for following your questions and the answers. I was hoping I'd avoided this one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm struggling to identify one thing, but I think one of my favorite pieces of feedback recently was someone who took part in my introductory workshop. And they said um, the key thing that they took away from it that I'd said that I couldn't remember saying was that co-design is hard work. No, now I can't remember it. Isn't that funny? I can't even quote myself. I'm not very good at remembering quotes. Um, basically, though, what they were saying was that even though it's it can be really hard, it also can be fun. And one of the things that I love when people remember or rediscover is the value of being playful and I, I've seen that a few times recently that people have felt a bit stuck especially if you're you know working on a really complex issue so some of my clients for instance are you know designing a response to family violence that's not a fun issue but there are ways to approach it with lightness with playfulness that open up all kinds of possibilities that aren't as accessible to you if you are, you know, not letting yourself laugh or imagine joy. So interesting that these are things that uh, we know are important, but maybe are pushed out of us um, because uh, it's not the default culture within work in environments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, anything else you want to add there? I think. One of the things that, yeah, people also realize is that it can be small. And this relates to what we were saying already. Like you don't have to have huge numbers of people who take part. People are sometimes surprised when I say we can, you know, go through a co-design process looking at a complex issue with a core group of 12 to 15 co-designers if you've, you know, kind of carefully selected people to represent different kinds of experiences and perspectives so that there is diversity within that group, if you've got the right mix of people who understand the issue and are committed, that's that's a good number of people to mm -hmm. be involved. Yeah. A small is a relative number, right? It's a, mm. What is small? So sticking, uh, sticking to this, what have you seen or what are some situations where you see good intentions of doing good co-design uh, sort of sort of go wrong? Where When does good co-design fall flat? One of the most frustrating things that happens, I think, is when things seem to be set up while you've got, say, I don't know, an organization, maybe a few organizations have come together and said they're going to fund and support this project and, and you're going to go through a co-design process. And everyone involved has good intentions and, and is interested in seeing whatever is designed come to life. At some point, it doesn't get realized. And this happens a lot for various reasons. Sometimes there isn't true commitment from the organizations to actually implement whatever is designed. Sometimes they're not as open as they said they might have been to actually letting the people involved design something. They might have had another solution that they wanted implemented and were hoping that was going to be the result. Or sometimes the government changes, there's a new policy the funding is no longer available, the leader who sponsored that has left. There are so many reasons why things don't get realized, but it can be so frustrating for everyone involved. And some of that can be avoided if they're, if you're not paying attention to, to the context and not thinking about where the thing you're designing is going to land to make sure that that's part of your process. But some of it is just shit happens. Yeah, and this is, uh, I'm assuming this is something that uh, the listeners here will recognize a lot that implementation is one of, 
probably the hardest thing actually realizing and getting these solutions out into the world where they impact the customers, the company, um, because that's the moment where things uh, start to hurt. People actually feel a difference, like the research stage and the ideation stage, the prototyping stage. That's still sort of, that's the playground. And then when uh, when you need to put it out into the world, people actually need to do stuff, think budgets need to be aligned. And that's like, uh, yeah. I was going to say, this is where if you do co-design well, it can help though, because you can get, once you know what kind of thing you're going to be implementing, you can make sure people who would be involved in implementing it are part of the design and prototyping, especially in the prototyping phase. So done well, you can try and address some of this. Like if you know you're going to be developing a marketing campaign, make sure you've got someone with marketing knowledge in your co-design group. Um, I think that's also one of the mistakes people make or a misconception about co-design is that it's it's just the, the consumers or the users or the people with lived experience. And definitely co-design is, you know, when we turn towards co-design, one of the reasons is we're interested in trying to address some of the power imbalances and privilege the voice of lived experience. But that doesn't mean we should stop listening to professional experience and consider the lived experience of people who work within these systems and what they know about implementation and try and build that into the process too. Yeah, absolutely. And the people who you work with are just as important as the people who you work, quote unquote, for. Uh, and somehow we tend to forget that. that uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Have you seen situations where you thought, um, well, a co-design approach actually wasn't helpful here, or we should stay away from co-design? Like, it, I can imagine that there is like uh, a, a danger where co-design is seen like the answer to everything. Everything should be co-designed. Should everything be co-designed? No. <laughs> I think there are there are some situations that are more technical and technical expertise is really important. I think in those situations, so I'm thinking of an example of involving people in evaluation, say, and you absolutely can take participatory approaches to evaluation. But I can remember a project I was involved in where there wasn't a lot of time for building capacity for people who'd not been involved in designing an evaluation before and implementing it to, to contribute to that. So I think on one hand, you have perhaps areas that are very technical and you can't just expect ordinary people to quickly grasp and be able to design in them. I think if you're really committed to being participatory you and you've got the time and resources, you can build capacity you know, so that people can, who, who are interested, you know, can increase their technical expertise. But that's not necessary, you know, is it necessary, I think is the question. Is like, is this, you have to ask, do you need to do that? So that's one area. Another example is more in like a chaotic space where it's, it's a, like a real crisis or things are changing so quickly. And I, for instance, was part of a team in Australia in the early period of COVID that were um, trying to develop a um, COVID tracking, tracing app. And it was such a chaotic situation. We were actually working for a state government department that didn't know the federal government department was also doing this process itself. And so... And there was such a rush, such a race to, to try and come up with something. However, that project was fascinating because there were all these health experts and technological experts very, very rapidly trying to come up with an app that could help people understand um, proximity and things like this, yet they weren't even planning to do any user testing before it was going to be launched and become compulsory. And that was, for me, quite horrifying. So even though there wasn't time to fully co-design and there were aspects of that that were technical, there was still a huge opportunity to, at the very least, consult with some consumers and 
thanks to the involvement of myself and a, a colleague, Anna Brown, we were able to at least make sure we consulted with a consumer reference group who, sure enough, you know, really busted some of the assumptions that the the development team had. Um, and when we saw the failure of that app in Australia, um, not the one we were working on, um, but the, the federal government's one, I also couldn't help but think if they'd just taken a little bit longer and at the very least done a little bit of user testing or consultation, even if not full co-design. Yeah, well, in the end, they do user testing, but uh, that happens when it's live and out in the public. And then <laughs> that's that's yeah. the full scale user testing. It's yeah. just, it becomes more expensive and more time consuming to fix the errors um, mm. when and it's out. And some of them, it, yeah, they can't in the end because they've, cho they've chosen a technological solution that is incompatible with iOS, for instance. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. Okay, so this uh, this helps. Um, another thing that I'm curious about is if you look at um, the set of people that you're working with, have you found specific talents or attitudes or skills that people need to have to be good co-designers? Good question. I've definitely found that there are people who have good people skills or facilitation skills, that they're not necessarily trained facilitators, but they have an ease or a capacity to bring people together and, and to host. And I actually really noticed this myself when last year I was working with someone who was a former English language teacher. And that's also what I did in the beginning of my career. And I hadn't realized how much of my English language teaching skills I'd actually transferred into co-design facilitation until I noticed someone else doing the same thing. So I think there's a variety of ways and places people might gain relevant facilitation skills, which I think are an important part of co-design. If you want to lead, I think there's lots of different roles in co-design and I would like to acknowledge that. Like co-design facilitation is very important, bringing people together, um, in a variety of ways and, and leading groups through design and innovation processes. But co-design also involves other design skills and, you know, having graphic designers and service designers on a co-design team with, they don't necessarily even need to be, you know, they don't themselves have to be the facilitator, but those are relevant skills to contribute, obviously. The other thing I'd say in response to that is I have noticed some people have more of a natural disposition to the co-design mindsets. One of them, um, and definitely here referencing the mindsets um, that K.A. McKercher puts forth through Beyond Sticky Notes. So um, one of them, the idea of being in the gray, for instance, being comfortable with ambiguity and uncertainty is one that many of us struggle with. That's definitely been an area of uh, growth and challenge for me personally to, you know, not, not see things black and white, to, you know, be able to sit with all of the complexity and not jump to a solution or uh, need, need things to be predictable. That can be challenging. And some people are just better at that than others. But I think these are things you can learn. And I've seen that especially through some of my coaching and mentoring clients, especially when we're on more of the kind of mindsets side of things. I think those are things that take, if they're not your natural disposition, it can take time to adjust um, and it can be helpful to reflect on, you know, how you're feeling about things, what your natural response is, how you yourself can kind of manage yourself to be in the gray if that's not something that's comfortable for you. And so I think it is possible to learn to be better at it, but I do want to acknowledge it does just come more easily for some people. Hmm. This is uh, very interesting. I had a related question to your coaching experience and you already sort of hinted upon it. And I don't know if there's an answer, but let's find out. What do you see that people need most support? Is there a specific area? Is there a pattern that you have discovered? I think the only, there's a lot of different things that different people need support in depending on their skills, their experience, the work that they're doing. 
But if there's only one pattern, it's probably moral support. It's hard work, to, especially to do co-design well. You are balancing a lot of sometimes conflicting demands and interests. You are working with a lot of different people. If you're doing it in the space of social innovation or systems change, you're trying to respond to some really complex issues that are connected with some really complex issues that are causing major harm in the world. So it's a lot. It's a lot to handle. And like we said before, if you're doing this at a pace and, you know, with huge expectations sometimes with a high workload and lots of demands, it can be really full on. So sometimes it can just really help people to have someone just to talk to about what they're doing, what they're going through, somebody to help validate if things are being done well or if they are having a negative experience. Um, someone, yeah, to, to kind of walk alongside them, basically. Yeah. yeah. And this Do you is find also, this in your oh, community? Oh, 100%. And I was mm. uh, just writing down uh, this morning that um, this circle community, and I think it goes for you as well, is a place where just professionals can laugh together, can cry together, can celebrate wins and learn from uh, failures. And that's um, that's already a lot. And I think you're describing something similar. One of the one of the upcoming events that we actually have as part of Co-Design Co, the community of practice, is around the kinds of support, the different models or forms of support that practitioners might be able to access um, and benefit from, like supervision, coaching, mentoring, peer coaching or supervision. I think in some fields, these are really established practices and there are frameworks and even expectations. You know, if you're doing social work or therapy, for instance, it's expected that you have supervision. That's not something that is established for designers or facilitators. Uh, yeah, you might you might be working in an organization and have a manager, but that doesn't mean you're actually getting practice supervision, um, especially according to any kind of ethical frameworks. So one of the things we're really interested in, and, and this is um, I'm doing this with K.A. McKercher, Kirsty Alderton, and Morgan Cataldo, who, um, as well as there'll be other members of our community of practice, kind of contributing to building our knowledge uh, about these different kinds of practices of support um, that we might be able to use and offer. And uh, that's going to be really helpful because showing, um, creating awareness, building vocabulary around what types of support you can get, mentoring, coaching, training, communities, um, that sort of opens up your eyes that there, like you don't have to do it alone and you can actually pick and choose and find how you want to be supported. Totally. It's one of the things I've been trying to figure out for myself, operating my own business. You know, I've been in organizations where I haven't received the kind of support I would like either. And I know that for, you know, many friends and colleagues, unfortunately, that's the case too. So I've been thinking for a while about like, how do I create my own support team and structures and networks of support? And it's obviously especially important for someone like myself who is who is working alone a lot of the time. You know, I do work in collaboration. I have contractors and collaborators and clients, but, you know, I'm not in any kind of formal team or organization. But speaking with people even who work in-house, actually, sometimes they need to do the same thing too. This is, uh, I'm, I'm going to follow uh, your um, progress on this topic because I think it will be very relevant for this community as well. Um, am I heading towards uh, sort of the end of our chat? I'm um, I'm really interested to hear your perspective on the future and if you look into the future of Go Design, what are the things or what is the thing that excites you the most? I've been pleasantly surprised to see Co Design mainstreaming here in Australia in the social and public sectors, at least, I think. I'm not sure how this compares with elsewhere, but he here in Victoria, in Australia, for instance, it's quite common for government policy to say 
co-design is happening, for government funding requirements to say you have to co-design this thing. So as a result of that, I've seen increasing demand and interest in co-design. I think there's a huge risk that we continue to see really token efforts or shallow forms or faux design happening. But in the community and communities that I am part of, I am surrounded by really thoughtful, critical people who question dominant norms in design and ask themselves and ourselves how we can do better and are really interested, for instance, in culturally responsive and and trauma-informed ways of working. So I think we're going to see kind of more and more of this, this work. I'm curious to see whether we get any kind of clear ethical standards or guidelines, Mm -hmm. you know, out of that of like, what, what do we say is good co-design and as an, as a sector, as an industry or as a community, maybe are we going to start defining these things more clearly or is there advantage in leaving it open and flexible um, to be more responsive? So that's something I I don't, I I have no crystal ball, but I'm curious to see what happens in that regard. Very interesting topic. Um, I have some thoughts on that as well, but we'll leave that for a different conversation. Oh, can, can we hear some <laughs> of your thoughts? Well, I, sh- uh, briefly, I do think that uh, we are in a stage uh, where there is enough experience and knowledge to crystallize some learnings. And I don't like to use the word best practice because that's too rigid. But we definitely can um, provide some guidelines and compasses and uh, and manifestos um, that that uh, that sort of define a minimum minimum standards. Mm -hmm. And I do think that we have enough experience and knowledge right now to to know what at least some of these minimum standards are related to doing good code design, related to doing good service design, and that that. it's we're not starting from scratch. There are already some very good efforts going on, but I do think we need more. Mm. Well, maybe that's something we could collaborate on too. <laughs> uh, let's let's see, um, Emma. If somebody made it all the way here uh, to this point in our conversation, what is the one thing you hope that they will remember? To be playful and value relationships. Be playful and value relationships. Thank you so much, uh, Emma, for taking the time uh, to sharing your journey with us, uh, to sharing what you're doing, uh, the amazing work that's happening in Australia and that's trickling to the rest of the world. Really looking forward to seeing how your journey evolves and uh, how our paths maybe intersect in the uh, coming months and years. Yeah, thanks so much, Mark. It's been a really interesting conversation and I uh, genuinely hope that we are able to continue it and keep exchanging ideas about supporting these similar overlapping communities um, that, that we're leading. Thanks a lot, Emma. What's your biggest takeaway from this conversation with Emma? Leave a short comment down below. I'd love to hear from you. And if you've made it this far into the conversation and enjoyed what we talked about, make sure to click that like button. This lets me know whether or not we're on the right track by addressing topics like this. My name is Mark Fontaine and I want to thank you for spending a small part of your day with me. It was an absolute honor and pleasure. Please keep making a positive impact and I'll catch you very soon in the next episode of the Service Design Show. See you soon.